Okay, so good morning and welcome to Ag Talking Raw, where I talk raw about agriculture and other things that are on my mind. Uh, the reason I'm going to, uh, well, I haven't posted anything here in a while, probably since before I went to North Carolina, so I'm going to say May, uh, maybe even April, I don't know. But anyway, uh, I was watching the news last night, and I didn't watch bumbling Joe Biden uh, make his speech or anything, but in the news last night, uh, there was a, an interview with Mike Pence, and apparently Mike Pence didn't watch uh, Bumble and Joe Biden's uh, speech either, because the reporter asked him what he thought about Joe Biden's comment on black and brown people having land set aside for them for agriculture so that black and brown skinned people can, uh, you know, be farmers and be subsidized by the government to be farmers. Well, I have a, uh, I don't know, I have a problem with two things. Set aside, setting aside land for uh, black and brown skinned farmers means that they're taking that land away from uh, farmers that are already in full production, uh, say myself and just about every other uh, farming uh, channel out there should uh, kind of would want to agree with me and uh, uh, that, you know, that's kind of pointless. Producing food to uh, the public is what we do best. Uh, it really is. We've been, our skills are honed. We're constantly learning new, new things. And I'm not saying that this world isn't full of opportunity for black and brown skinned people. I, I mean, it doesn't matter what color your skin is. As far as I'm concerned, if you want to be a farmer, go out and be a farmer. You know, if you want to learn the trade, go get a job working with a farmer. But I know some things. I know some things because I've been in the areas uh, where where black and brown skinned people are heavily concentrated. Um, two places uh, uh, that I've been recently in the last two years, a year and a half, two years, two seasons, uh, was the eastern shore of Maryland and Virginia and uh, North Carolina. Now, North Carolina was a slave state back in the uh, forever, up until 1860, uh, was it 1862, Emancipation Proclamation was uh, signed by the president at the time, Abraham Lincoln, freeing the slaves, uh, and of course the South went nuts. I think it was 1862. He might have did that later during the course of the war. I don't, I don't know. My history is, is vague in that area, uh, you know, but anyway. Okay, so I've had many conversations with black folk, uh, young and not not young, old, old black folk down in down in North Carolina. Okay, and as a matter of fact, it was an old fella in uh, Virginia. That was it, Virginia. It was Virginia. I was at a I was at a laundromat in uh, in Virginia, and I was speaking with a man there, and he was a, a black man, but he didn't look a hundred percent black. His skin was lighter than uh, most people but he was just a man let's just call him a man I was talking to this man there and when he asked me uh, what I was doing there and I said that I was doing custom work and uh, he was like oh don't they do that here I says well they they don't know that I mean they wouldn't have hired me to do it if they did it here because I mean there is a few people that do that work there but they would have hired me to come down and do it if, if they were doing it there and uh, we had a really nice conversation I got a little hot and uh, a little hot, but not overheated that we were yelling at one another. It was just a little bit like, you know, I want to know what makes you think this way. Well, the reason that he thought the way that he thought wasn't because he knew anything about uh, the current president or the uh, the way the Constitution was written or even the Bill of Rights is laid out. Um, I don't claim to be an expert. Uh, I've read the Bill of Rights. Um, the Constitution of the United States is basically the law of the land with the Bill of Rights and uh, the amendments that have been put into it over the years and how it takes two-thirds of the country to change the Constitution or put an amendment in. Um, so two-thirds of the country, not two-thirds of Congress, two-thirds of the country. I believe pretty much two-thirds of the Congress as well. 
uh, meaning the House of Representatives, but still it has to go through its, its you know, rigorous testing and whatever. Not testing, but uh, um, I don't know what you would call it. Not testing, but uh, overview or oversight, as they call it. They're all about oversight. <coughs> Excuse me, I got the round up. Oh, my wife just brought me this beautiful cup of coffee. Thank you, my love. Shake it, shake it. I love that girl. Anyway, um, yeah, so I had this conversation with uh, the, that guy on the Eastern Shore, and he was convinced that Donald Trump had colluded with the Russians, which is not illegal to, but I guess it's not illegal. It's not. Anyway. He needed to be, he was impeached, and he needed to be impeached because he lied about, we don't, he didn't even know what he lied about, just that he lied, because I asked him, I said, so what did he lie about? And uh, the, the, well, I don't know what he lied about. It doesn't matter what he lied about. All I know is that he lied because he got impeached. Well, lo and behold, a year later, or nine months later at this point, um, a year later since he's been impeached, because he got impeached about a year ago, uh, they're coming out with all the lies that were told by the people that impeached him. You know, Comey, McCabe, all those guys. They knew Obama and Biden knew what was going on with the, the spying on his campaign and all this stuff. But that's really not what we're talking about here. So he shook hands at the end of this conversation and said, you know, that was a nice debate. I said, I wish more people could debate like that. And he says, you know, I do too. Now, here's a white guy from New Jersey, a black fellow from uh, Virginia, and we had a debate, you know, he disagreed with some of the things I said, I disagreed with a lot of the things that he said, I tried to educate him, he tried to educate me. The problem was that the facts proved, the facts that I was stating uh, proved that the facts that he was stating were not fact, they were actual lies. Now, not all of them. I mean, not all of them. But his information came from CNN, MSNBC, CBS, um, ABC, and all the major networks. Um, my information actually came from watching the uh, watching the the trial, the how you know, listening to it, watching it, listening to it while I was working and actually listening to what was being said and how it was being portrayed and how when the subject got too sensitive or was leaning towards the exoneration of the president that they would cut off that particular senator, congressman, congresswoman that was speaking. And when people do that, it basically means that, well, we don't need the public to hear that and it, your time has expired, even though it hadn't or you know, one person would allocate time to for that man to keep going, and they're like, no, no, your time, that's been denied. You know, just stuff like that. Yes, I'm slurping my coffee. And a year later, you know, we find out that the things that they were saying were true and what the Democrats were trying to squash were um, were true. They, the Democrats tried to squash what was being said. And it's kind of sad to watch that. So anyways, fast forward again. Uh, Joe Biden wants blacks and brown-skinned people to have land allocated to them by the U.S. government, by the way. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Now, Joe Biden may have just lost the, the black vote by saying that, because black folks attribute farming to slavery. Not all of them. Not all of them. There are some black folks that work down in North Carolina with farmers. They enjoy their jobs. They get paid fairly well for what the, the work that they do and they're happy. But the vast majority of black folks think of farming as a form of slavery. It reverts them back to when they were slaves in 1862. Even though they don't remember it, they don't know anybody that remembers it, and they don't know anybody that could possibly remember it because it happened 150 some odd years ago. Actually 155 years ago. Uh, the end of slavery was in 1865. Nobody's alive. They're all dead. Long dead. Um, but we're in this this age of cancel culture where, you know, a statue of, say, Robert E. Lee, which does not offend me in the least, and I'm from the, from the North. Yes, I'm white, but that shouldn't make any difference. I am a man, and, uh, you know, it shouldn't make any difference, and it doesn't make any difference to anybody else. 
You see, when you delete the history and the showing of that history, whether it offends you or not, history should offend you. Uh, not all of it, but some portions of it, so that you are not destined to repeat it. And repeating history is never any good, unless it's, I don't know, I don't know what history is good. I mean, there's, they don't really emphasize on the good, good parts of history. They only emphasize the bad, like World War One, World War Two, Civil War, slavery, you know, and, uh, but there was a lull in the United States when we were isolationists, okay? So, isolationists from 1812, okay, that was from 1812 right on up to World War I. And then back to isolationists again until World War II. Since World War II, we're in everybody's business. We don't give a damn. We're just like, oh, a little skirmish going on here? We'll give you money. We'll give you arms. We'll come in. We'll help you out. You know, and then we're fighting and killing and dying. Um, our people are dying and stuff like that. So I kind of like the isolationist uh, era from 1812 to 1918. Really, the only thing that happened within the United States that was negative was the Civil War, the ending of slavery. Um, from that point on, it's been a downhill spiral for us to be in everybody's business. And that's another reason why I like Donald Trump, you know, for the simple reason is, why are we in their business? We've got oil here. We've got energy. We shouldn't be shipping it out of our country. We should be uh, distributing to the people here in this country with, uh, you know, so that we have cheap transportation and, and prosperous, uh, you know, a prosperous economy because of it. You know, and exporting it does cost us more money in the end. But that's not free and fair trade, and we need free and fair trade to keep our economy going. So there will be exporting of gas and oil and stuff like that because we are producing plenty. Plenty. Um, so that's, you know, that's what's going on here. So you talk to the black folks down in, in North Carolina. And when they see a farmer, the black folks see a farmer, they'll wave. But you're not going to get them to buy a farm. You are not going to get them to work on a farm. You are just the southern, the southern blacks. Now, northern blacks are different. And I've told people this before, uh, especially down there, because we, we've had conversations about the, the blacks down in, in, say, North Carolina and Virginia and how they are slaves to our government. You see, in, eight, in 1960, what, 1962, I believe it was, President Johnson uh, enacted the Welfare Act, and since then, it's been a downhill, downhill spiral for the black, southern black community. They've got, they were given trailers, they were given, you know, places to live, okay? They've been given a paycheck to not work, you know, it's welfare, they... It, the, the cards are stacked against them to get off of welfare, and it is rare that the black community down there, someone from the black community down there, gets off of welfare and goes out and becomes a productive individual. Now, it's, it's rare, but it does happen, and those blacks that do that, those black folks, they come up to New Jersey, New York, and this up to the north where they have work and they will work, and then when they get to retirement age from working here, they go home. They go back to North Carolina. They buy a piece of ground. They take care of their land. Their homes look immaculate. They they just they've broken away and became, um, you know, independent, uh, independent of the chains that the government has put them in. And you know, <laughs> some people may think I'm being racist right now. I'm not. And there's white people that are in the same boat down there. Um, my opinion on welfare in the South is that they need to do a re-education program, get these people back to work. Now, when it comes to the brown-skinned people, like South Americans, Mexicans, Guatemalans, Argentinians, anybody that has come from up from down there, up here, whether it be by legal or illegal means, um, they used to come legally. The Me the Mexicans did, you know, from actual Mexico, and. Back in, I think, 1994, 
Um, President Clinton at the time made it very difficult to renew the visas, the work visas. Now, when you have a black community that refuses to work in the fields because they attribute it to slavery, you have to have somebody that's going to work. And it's not like white people wouldn't work in the fields. They don't get paid enough because we have to have cheap food to feed the masses. Um, so white white kids, for some reason, just whether it's their parents or whatever, I would, I've worked in the fields and it doesn't bother me in the least. I still work in the fields. I'm white. I don't hire people to go do my work for me. I do it myself and I'm white. So don't call me a hypocrite either because I'm not. But the legal immigration or the migrant worker immigration, when Bill Clinton signed that, those bills that made it very difficult for them to come up and actually work for six months and then go back and then a week or two weeks before it's time for the the sweet potato harvest or whatever you know to come up they file for the work visa and then come it made it so difficult that when you go back you have six months process to get that work visa and it was easy for that easier for them to overstay their visa and send the money back uh, via Western Union and whatever else, uh, uh, what other apps we have now, uh, back to Mexico and they've stayed. Now, they've stayed. Uh, they were given amnesty. I don't remember whether it was Carter that gave them am some of them amnesty. I know Carter gave amnesty. I'm pretty sure that Clinton gave amnesty. And I almost think that Reagan gave amnesty as well. Now, George Bush, I don't know. He may have, get, they, they're given amnesty to these people. So they're on, am, they get amnesty and, hey, I'm an illegal. I can't work, you know, and I've been given amnesty. Then they're citizens of the United States. Now they got all the paperwork. They go on welfare. So now we've got the blacks who haven't wanted to work since 1960s. We've got the, the brown skins that haven't wanted to work since the mid 90s, early 2000s, by the time they were all just like, fuck it, we're staying here. We'll send the money back. They're illegal. Uh, we don't want to work and now they become legal or maybe they're still, who knows? They're on the welfare system because there's groups of them. Okay, so you have the black community that don't work. They just collect welfare. You've got the brown skin community that don't work. They just collect welfare because why would they go back to the fields? My parents migrated from Mexico, came up here, worked their fingers to the bone until there was nothing left, and I'll be damned if I'm going to suffer the same fate. Didn't say that they got paid, you know. <laughs> no, they did. Um, so that's that's the idea, or that's, that's, the, that's what's happening. Um, if you set aside... A million acres, which if you take a million acres out of, you know, government acres, let's just say all the state parkland that has open land on it that I used to farm, that I used to get a contract on every year because they wouldn't do five-year contracts or pain in the ass. Suppose those, that acreage that someone's farming, maybe nobody's farming, has to, well, nobody's farming. State of New Jersey cut it all out. But just, just say that Joe Biden gets in the office and he goes to Governor Murphy, the idiot we have here, and says, we need farmland for brown and black people, brown skin and black people. Um, you've got state park land that's not being farmed. Now, it's been neglected for years now, so it's, it's absolute crap. This is going to be a shit show at best, even if you do find somebody that wants to farm it. And there's federal lands all over this country that people ranch and farm on that are of my hue, uh, are they going to take that away from them just so that they can put an inexperienced, no skilled individual on that land with 40 acres and a mule? I mean, think about this. It's not going to work out. It isn't going to work out. They're going to take productive land. It's going to lose production until they, if they stick, stick with it. And I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of money to boot. Oh, I guarantee you. If, if I was black or, or brown, and I wanted to get, well, I guess my wife, I could have my wife become a, an independent farmer. And, you know, she could say, hey, you know what, Wesley, I'm not going to farm with you anymore. I'm going to break out on my own. There might be a million dollar carrot dangling in front of her. You know what I mean? Might be. Could be. Million dollar carrot. 
So, I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? But I'm pretty sure that's how it's going to go. But anyways, my point is, and I'm sure there's people going to disagree with me. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more that know what's going on in the South that will agree with me that they attribute farming to slavery and that the Mexicans don't want to, the, 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 the people that, the brown skins that have been here for a long time that don't go back, that were products or the DACA children or all those people, they're not going to do it either because they don't want to be in those fields where their parents were working their fingers to the bone. Now, my hat is off to the migrant workers and the workers that are actually in those fields picking sweet potatoes, planting sweet potatoes, dealing with watermelons, cantaloupes, pickles, the pickle pickers and all that stuff. They are hardworking men and women. Believe me, I witnessed it. You know, I'm not talking about those people. What I'm talking about are actual people that are in this country. There, there are black farmers in the South. Believe me, I tried to meet one. I asked a, fr a friend of mine that works down there, I said, hey, do you know anybody, that, any black farmers down there? Because I'd really like to meet a black farmer. I want to see if their views are the same as mine. I want to see if they're, what their deal is. And he says, yeah, I got a buddy. He's, he's black and he, he has a farm. Uh, doesn't do so well because, you know, it just, it just doesn't do so well. And it doesn't make any sense because it doesn't matter what color your skin is. It's all what's behind the eyeballs. Um, if you want your farm to do well, you will do the, your best to your ability. And maybe that's all they're doing. I, I don't know. Um, he said he doesn't do very well, but he's still farming. So, they farm. Uh, but anyways, 21 minutes of this is long enough. I'm going to wrap it up. I am not racist. I just see things the way I see them. And I know things about what they're, what they're what's going on. And if Joe Biden thinks that he's going to get a bunch of black people to go farm, he is sorely mistaken. He might get a few, a few people that are from, the, say, the north or in an area where, you know, they 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 lived in the country and they saw the farms across the street, you know, and thought, well, that'd be pretty cool to do. Maybe I, my lifelong dream is to be a farmer. Um, I actually have hired a drop my drop my new driver. I got a new driver now. Um, his name is Lewis, and uh, he's he's a black man. He's going to be driving my truck. Uh, I don't care what color he is. As long as he doesn't wreck the truck, we'll be good. So, uh, actually, I'm looking forward to Lewis starting because I'm too tired to do this job. I'm too tired. I can't get I can't get home at 10, be in bed by 10.30, and get up at 3.30 to go do the job. Because if I leave now at 8 o'clock, I ain't going to make it. I'll die. <laughs> but anyways, thanks for watching.